Welcome, everyone, to episode 58. If you've been listening to the series on the Kingdom Plantea, you've just listened to episodes about green algae, about mosses and liverworts, and most recently, about ferns and lycophytes. Today's episode will continue onwards, down the evolutionary lineage that is the plant kingdom, to the next major divergence, which created a group called the spermatophytes, or the seed plants. Over millions of years, these seed plants underwent multiple waves of radiation and diversification to create this incredibly huge range of species. The extant seed plants can be divided into five groups, which I'll talk about momentarily. These are the Pinophyta, the Cycadophyta, the Ginkophyta, the Nidophyta, and the Magnoliophyta. Of these five groups, only the Magnoliophyta have flowers. These are the angiosperms. The other four groups are all called gymnosperms, or the naked seed plants, and they'll be the focus of today's episode. The capacity to use seeds instead of spores was catalyzed by two major evolutionary events. They were both cases of major genome duplication and subsequent diversification, which gave rise to the gene groups responsible for seed and flower development. The first case of gene duplication occurred in the early Carboniferous period, about 319 million years ago. This major mutation modified the sporangia and turned megaspores into seeds. The second case of gene duplication occurred in the very early days of the Jurassic period, about 190 million years ago. This would lead to the emergence and diversification of genes involved in the production of flowers, which is what defines the angiosperms, or the flowering plants. However, I'll talk more about these flowering plants in the next episode. Today is about the gymnosperms, which are the seed plants that don't express flowers. Because they don't produce their seeds in fruits or in flower structures, they're called naked seed plants because their seeds are quite often just nakedly exposed to the elements, but it's how they've evolved to reproduce. The early ancestors of the seed plants began to appear almost 400 million years ago in the form of the progymnosperms. These ancient, extinct plants had traits that we associate not just with vascular plants like the ferns they arose from, but the modern conifers and flowering plants. These progymnosperm ancestor plants had woody tissue with xylem and phloem, and the vascular cambium for secondary growth. Many of them were also heterosporous, which exhibits the slow evolutionary emergence of specialized, sexually dimorphic spores. The male version is the microspore, which is tiny so it can float on the wind and move between individual trees or individual plants. While the female analog is the megaspore, which is retained on the the parent plant, and it's the ovule with the egg inside that will eventually become the seed. At some point in time, an individual within a population of these progymnosperms experienced the first of these two major gene duplications, and they experienced a radically altered expression of their spores. This conferred to them some kind of evolutionary adaptation, some benefit, and so the trait spread throughout the population, and soon led to the emergence of the first true gymnosperms, the first true seed plants with real seeds, which came to dominate the tropical rainforests by outcompeting and pushing out native species of lycophyte plants and giant ferns. In much the same way that flowering plants use animals like bees or hummingbirds to transport pollen between individuals to aid in their reproduction, you know, they use these insects or these birds as pollinators, some gymnosperms have also evolved these uh, mutualist relationships. But because they don't have flowers, they attract the animal in slightly different ways. For example, the calligrammated lacewings are insects that are really similar to butterflies, but they went extinct millions of years before modern butterflies actually emerged. The calligrammated lacewings are so similar because of convergent evolution in their morphology, their pigmentation, and their development. But for the purposes of today's episode, the only relevant similarity is their mouth parts, which allows both the calligrammated and the modern butterfly to suck up fluids like nectar out of a flower or out of some kind of plant structure. So where the modern butterfly uses its proboscis to drink the nectar out of a flowering plant, The extinct calligrammatid probably used its thicker, sturdier proboscis to penetrate the harder ovum of gymnosperm genuses that existed at the same time and in the same place, like Bienia, Catonia, Catonianthus, 
Williamsonia, and Waltrichia. Other animal species are suggested to have developed these mutualist pollinator relationships with the gymnosperms during the Jurassic and the early Cretaceous periods. Various species of scorpion flies in the order Mechoptera had developed rudimentary proboscis organs, which they used to suck at the nutrient-rich secretions coming out of the seed-producing ovule. Gymnosperms, like some of the Catoniaceae and Pytoxalaceae, uh, as well as the Natales, which all existed around the same time and in the same place as the scorpion flies, had all evolved a particular ovule structure and morphology that one study described as, quote, either unusual for wind pollination or possessed structures that would be expected for long proboscid fluid feeding, unquote. However, pretty much all of these mutualist relationships between pollinators and gymnosperms were destroyed when the angiosperms appeared and achieved ecological dominance in the mid to late Cretaceous. Their rapid diversification and spread either stole the gymnosperm pollinators or brought with them pollinators of their own that outcompeted the gymnosperm pollinators. However it happened, the emergence and diversification of the flowering plants led to the disappearance of the gymnosperm mutualist relationships along with most of their pollinators. Although life is adaptable, plastic, and moldable, and it was only a matter of time until new mutualist relationships were established. Interestingly, many cycads have recently developed mutualist relationships with various beetles. One of the gymnosperm groups used to be quite widespread and diverse, but it suffered a relatively rapid period where the number of species dwindled to the point where there was only one left. This group is the ginkgos, which are a relatively small gymnosperm group with 11 known species. Of these 11, 10 are extinct, and only one of them, Ginkgo biloba, still exists. This lone ginkgo species struggled to survive in central China as time dragged on through the end of the Cretaceous and the whole Cenozoic era, in a world where every other ginkgo species was long gone. The ginkgo has fan-shaped leaves, which have a thick, leathery texture, and are known during the autumn season to turn from green to yellow super quickly, in the span of just one or two days. The ginkgo possesses nutritious seeds that are often harvested and used in Chinese cuisine, although to get to the seeds, you have to scrape off all the fruit flesh covering it. This fruiting tissue of the ginkgo produces hexanoic and butanoic acids, which make it smell absolutely terrible, like decaying meat. After the seeds have been removed from the fruit and cleaned, the seeds don't have the scent. They smell totally fine, but the fruit tissue itself the waste that you have to throw away and that you get all over your hands while you're cleaning the seeds, it smells like a huge pile of puke or a rotting corpse that's been locked in a small room on a hot day. An interesting detail about the ginkgos is that because of a confluence of factors about their behavior and life strategies, they're remarkably slow to evolve. First, ginkgos are extremely long-lived, with the oldest individual ginkgo trees being on the order of 1,500 years old. Many of these ancient ginkgo trees existed near Buddhist or Confucian temples, where the local monks used them as a source of food that would eat the seeds instead of just cutting down the tree to make more open space. The ginkgos are also relatively slow to reproduce, and in the wetlands of China, they were able to spread out across a virtually continuous expanse of ground. With such long lives, the ginkgos can reproduce and reintroduce their genes into the gene pool hundreds, tens, or hundreds of years after they might have last reproduced. Or they can just keep steadily putting their genes into the gene pool for centuries. With relatively slow reproductive rates, the statistical probability of an emergent mutation being beneficial and then being spread across the population is much less per unit time than it is in a species that has a much higher or much faster reproductive rate. Because of their continuous carpeting of the landscape, cre creating a physically continuous population, the many billions of ginkgo plants created a, a continuous genetic gradient, where traits from one end of the geographic range could move to the other end through an unbroken stretch of habitat. This would create just this huge, geographically massive corridor for gene flow. All of these factors contribute to suppressing divergence and speciation, because all of the individuals from across this huge geographic range 
are all generally sharing this one giant interconnected amorphous gene pool. They don't have any areas where, a, where a, a smaller subpopulation can branch out into a new niche and kind of diversify a little bit. That didn't really happen. You just have this huge swath of relatively genetically homogen homogeneous ginkgos. All of these factors contributed to suppress divergence and speciation, which gave the ginkgo some degree of phenotypic and genotypic plasticity, but prevented them from fully diverging and speciating too often. The one extant ginkgo species, ginkgo biloba, is a distant relative to all the other gymnosperms, as the ginkgos were one of the first groups to diverge from the main gymnosperm lineage, and because the intermediate ginkgo species that had closer genetic ties to the common ancestor have all gone extinct, that only leaves this one distant cousin. But despite this relative distance, no pun intended, the ginkgos can still be tied into the gymnosperm family. For example, they reproduce with sperm that possesses flagella, so as to swim through water, which is a trait that the ginkgos share with cyacids. The cyacids are also an early emergence in the gymnosperm line, which supports the argument that they share a common ancestor with ginkgos that diverge from the rest of the gymnosperms relatively early, sometime around 300 million years ago. The cyacids are dioecious plants, meaning that individuals are either entirely male or entirely female. There are no monoecious plants with both male and female sex structures. Because of this, cyacids cannot reproduce asexually, and they have to engage in sexual reproduction to make offspring. Like their ginkgo cousin, the cyacids grow and reproduce slowly, and they have very long lives, with some cyacid individuals being more than a thousand years old. However, where the ginkgo grow wild only in a small spot in central China, the cyacids grow wild on every continent except Europe and Antarctica. They grow in the tropics and subtropics, in places like Florida, Mesoamerica, and the northern forests and tropical grasslands of South America. They grow over almost the entirety of Africa, south of the Sahel, and they grow across the entirety of the Southeast Asian archipelago, from India, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, and others on the mainland, to Malaysia and Indonesia, to Papua New Guinea, and much of the coastal area of Australia. The cycads have an interesting growth pattern. They have a primary trunk that doesn't branch out. It doesn't make branches like so many other plants do. Instead, the leaves grow directly out of the trunk. Think of the apical meristem on a plant, the group of stem cells at the very tip of the growing shoot that rise up into the air as they divide to produce cells that mature beneath them. That kind of lifts them up physically. Much the same way, the active leaves of a cycad grow out of the top of the shoot. As the leaves grow and age, they dry out and die, and most of the leaf tissue just falls off. It crumbles up and falls away, or it gets degraded somehow by the wind or an animal or whatever. This leaves behind a cratered socket or cavity in the stem where they were growing. In larger cycads that grow to the size of trees, these are what makes their woody stem look so gnarled and rough. The uppermost portion is where the new leaves grow, so as the leaves mature and die, they push this point of new leaf growth up and up, higher into the air, and the stem grows and the plant gets taller. This growth form can make taller cycads look really similar to palm trees, except palm trees are a whole other group of flowering plants that emerged many millions of years after cycads did. While taller cycads can reach the height of trees, Smaller species can be just a few centimeters tall. The leaves on a cycad look, in general, a lot like the leaves on a fern. They're pinnate leaves, with a central stalk that has long, narrow leaflets coming out in pairs to either side, like ribs coming out of the spinal column. Some species of cycads have double pinnate leaves, or bipinnate leaves, which are like a fractalized version of regular pinnate leaves. These have little stalks of pinnate leaves, all coming out of the main stalk in another pinnate arrangement. This pinnate nature of the leaves is really morphologically similar to ferns and palm trees, and that kind of contributes to a lot of misidentification. If it, if it doesn't help uh, for me to describe the shape of these leaves and the arrangement as just pinnate and double pinnate, uh, if you're not sure what that means and it's difficult for you to kind of visualize it based on my you know, mediocre description, uh, just, just Google it or look it up in Wikipedia. There's images you can find that just show a basic outline 
of a, of a pinnate or a double pinnate or a bipinnate leaf structure. This is what these, uh, these cyacids have. Where the ginkgo and the cyacids diverged early in the gymnosperm story, the conifers and the nidophytes diverged a little later on. The nidophytes are another small grouping, with some 70 or so closely related species in three major genuses. The Needham genus exists in tropical climates where they have a heavy presence in the Amazon, the western Congo, and southeast Asia. The genus Ephedra are more tolerant of colder temperatures, with less light and less water, and they've spread out to more temperate areas like the lands surrounding the Mediterranean, the Middle East, the Anatolian highlands, and the Caucasus, and the, and the bulk of Central Asia. The Welwitschia genus has the smallest range, existing only along a small patch of coastline on western Africa in the countries Angola and Namibia. All of the nidophytes used to be very widespread, kind of like the ginkgos, but they've since struggled to adapt to the climate and to other competitors, and over recent evolutionary time, their range has been reduced. The defining features uniting all of the nidophytes are the distinctive leaves called bracts that surround and protect the sexual structures as well as a similar functional structure that produces a pollen droplet to aid in reproduction. They also have structures in their vascular tissue called vessel elements, which are also found in angiosperms, but not in any other gymnosperms. You might think that this hints at a close genetic and evolutionary relationship between Nitales and the first angiosperms, linking the flowering plants to the rest of the seed plants. But it turns out that this is a case of convergent evolution, where each lineage independently evolved vessel elements. But besides these base similarities, the three genera of nidophytes hardly share any similarities with each other at all. They've been described as enigmatic and bizarre, because despite being closely related genetically, they're very morphologically different, as they've adapted to a huge range of habitats, from the temperate dryness of the Mediterranean to the cold, windy peaks of the mountains in Central Asia, to the brutal heart of the Arabian Desert, to the tropics of the Amazon and the Congo. Some species of these nidophytes, uh, like the Needham niman, grow as trees with huge, broad leaves. Other species, like the Ephedra distachia, grow as small, gnarly bushes. Just like the ginkgo biloba is the only species of ginkgo, there's only one species of Wolwichia, and this is called the Welwitschia mirabilis, which looks, uh, in my opinion, kind of like the eeyore of plants. They have a very short woody stem that looks more like a small wooden bucket or a bowl. The reproductive structures are generated from the stem and held aloft in the center of the plant, in the center of this, this bowl shape or this little wooden bucket that the, that the plant grows. The leaves themselves grow on the outer surface of this wooden structure. They extend outwards on or near the ground. The tallest mirabilis plants are no more than one and a half meters tall, but their leaves can be up to eight meters long. These long leaves often fray or split apart at the ends, which gives the whole plant the appearance of being a head with long, wet hair barely poking out of the ground. Their leaves are often twisted and dirty, tangled up in a loose mess. It looks like a plant's best attempt at imitating an octopus. Despite their extremely limited range near a short span of African coastline, they aren't particularly endangered. Their main threats are from fungal infections that reduce seed viability, and sometimes they get overgrazed by zebra. Humans aren't really much of a problem, especially in Angola, where landmines from a recent civil war generally do a pretty good job of keeping people away from the plants. The last group of gymnosperms are the conifers, which are by far the largest and most diverse group of all the seed plants that I've talked about today. The conifers include more than 65 genera and more than 600 species of plant. Every species of extant conifer is a perennial plant with a woody stem and branch tissue that's capable of engaging in secondary growth. The defining features of their evolution are the capacity to handle water stress better, and to have seeds and pollen that are perfected for cold, dry climates. Unlike other kinds of trees, and unlike many other plants, the conifers often have very strong apical dominance, which means they typically grow much taller than they grow wide, 
and their lateral branching tends to be less extensive and less complex than in other trees where the apical dominance isn't as strong. The titular quality of the conifer plants is their production of cones. In all conifers, the male cone is small and fragile, with soft herbaceous tissue surrounding a pulpy core. These soft cones are composed of modified leaves called microsporophylls that extend out from the center where they tightly overlap one another to form a beautiful geometric pattern that characterizes the cone. Protected under each little microsporophyll is a microsporangia organ that produces and stores the pollen. These can dry out and break apart and fall off the tree, or they can be eaten by birds or arboreal rodents. While these soft male cones are pretty similar from species to species, the female cones are much more diverse. The female cones contain the ovule, so they're much harder and sturdier, just generally more protective of the ovule that will eventually get fertilized to form the seed itself. It's important that the seed stays structurally intact, you know, this is what the next individual grows out of. But in the case of the, uh, of the male cone, where it's soft and kind of fleshy and it's just all these little sporangia that have spores everywhere, it's kind of intended for those to get destroyed. Because when they get chewed up or eaten or stomped on or dried out and degraded or blown away in the wind or whatever, they release spores everywhere. And all of those little spores flow through the air and land on other plants and potentially germinate other gymnosperms of the same species, other conifers, and they reproduce that way. The most typical conifer cones belong to the Pinaceae family, which includes pine trees, spruce trees, cedar trees, and uh, several other species. These pine cones have the stereotypical pattern of overlapping scales, which is really neat for two reasons. Uh, they look kind of like fish scales, and they're really aesthetically pleasing. You know, it's a nice geometry. And there's actually a, a mathematics behind this plant geometry, because the, the cones express their scales in these overlapping geometric patterns that match the ratios of Fibonacci numbers. In these plants, the ovule is surrounded by bracket leaves first. Then the actual scales of the cone form later as a kind of protective armor for the ovule. When the scales dry out, they'll bend and warp, which opens them up to allow pollen grains to get in and pollinate the seed. When the scales get wet, like from rain or humid weather, they seal back up into a tight cone shape. This is because spores aren't probably going to be very successful in floating through the air when it's raining. It's much more likely that the rain is going to intercept the spore and just splash it down on the ground somewhere. And also, if water gets into the seed, that can cause the seed to mold. And so it's important for the seed to kind of close up and seal itself off during these inopportune times when there's really not a good chance to get pollinated in the first place. It's like, okay, uh, we're taking a break, just shutting up shop for a moment. And then when the rain stops or when it gets dry, the scales will dry out and they'll open back up and uh, pollen can come in and pollinate the seed. Species of gymnosperm in the Aracariaceae family have fused scales that grow to form a smooth spherical cone like a large, hard shell around the seed. These can grow anywhere from 5 to 30 centimeters in diameter. A lot of cypress plants, like sequoia, junipers, and redwoods, have cones with peltate scales, or scales that aren't overlapping, but are instead separated by a small, narrow space. In this case, the scales kind of protrude outward, and so they create a space between the surface of the cone and the seed, but each individual scale isn't actually touching any other scale. In monoecious species of pine plants, the female cones are generally grown higher up on the tree than the male cones. This discourages self-pollination and asexual reproduction, and it encourages sexual reproduction, which produces and maintains a healthy genetic variety. In episode 53, I talked about plant reproduction. And in that episode, I talked at length about reproduction with seeds, and how pollination occurs, and how the seed forms. I'm not going to spend time repeating all of that information today, so I'll just go over the main points. The pollen grain has a generative cell that develops into a sperm and a pollen tube. The ovule goes through a weird process where it produces four gametophyte cells, but three of them die to leave a single one that remains, and this eventually produces the, the egg that can be fertilized. So, during pollination, the pollen tube reaches into the ovule to the egg, and sperm flows down the pollen tube to find and fertilize the egg. 
a seed will develop, containing an embryo that develops into differentiated tissues. The seed matures and gets released from the cone, where it lands on the ground and can germinate. The thing about conifer reproduction is that these cones can take many months to more than a year to fully mature, so conifer reproductive cycles can take place over not just one year, but across two-year or three-year cycles. In single-year cycles, the cone forms later in the year, before winter. These cones are dormant over winter and then reawaken in the spring to get pollinated, which leads to fertilization some three to four months later. The seeds are shed at the end of the year, so they have to endure another winter before they can germinate. But as far as the, the production period of a uh, first couple cells to fully formed, mature cone that dropped on the ground and is ready to germinate, it's about a year. In two-year cycles, the cones form in the fall, and then they wait out the winter, and then they get pollinated next spring, just like the one-year cones. However, these, these young two-year cones will spend the whole summer maturing as little conelets, before the pollination finally results in fertilization sometime next summer, a full year later, and this turns them into immature cones. The mature seeds get released in the second fall season, and they overwinter before germinating sometime in the next summer. In three-year cycles, the cones form in late summer or early fall. They wait through the winter, and they get pollinated in the spring, and then they turn into conelets. By the next spring, the spring of their third year of growth, if you count uh, the late summer to be their first year, uh, the conelets are still developing. But by the next spring and summer, in the fourth year, they finally fertilize and the seeds mature. At this point, the seeds can stay in the cones or they can be released, but either way, they have to endure another winter before they can germinate and start growing into a new individual. Pollination of these pine plants, regardless of how many years are in the reproductive cycle, is usually achieved by birds from the Corvidea family, like crows, jays, magpies, jackdaws, and ravens, among other species. So all of these gymnosperms that I've talked about, from the ginkgos to the pinacea, they all have a sporophyte-dominant life cycle. The large mature plant that's macroscopic that you would think of when you hear its name, uh, the large generation that grows for tens to hundreds to thousands of years, that's the sporophyte. This dominant sporophyte form is diploid, where in contrast, the haploid gametophyte is small and short-lived. The gametophytes are produced in the spores, where they form pollen grains. The pollen grain is the male gametophyte, and it produces sperm cells that can fertilize the mega gametophyte, or the female gametophyte. It works something like this. The sporophyte produces microspores and megaspores. The microspores develop into the male gametophytes, uh, the pollen grains, and they get released into the wind. The megaspores develop into the female gametophytes, but they don't get released. They stay within the archegonia. The ovule has a coating that forms the seed coat, but to be fertilized, the sperm has to make it through the hard outer coating layer to the egg inside. This is achieved through a structure called a micropile, which is a very small gap or a hole in the seed coat. Because this hole is extremely tiny, it might at first be a little confusing or unintuitive how pollination occurs. Well, remember how earlier I talked about the pollinators that would feed off of the ovular secretions? These insects would come and use their proboscis to drink the nutrient-rich fluid that seeps out of these micropiles. The purpose of this fluid is to physically trap a pollen grain. The pollen grain is floating out there in the wind. It's very dry, it's very light, and so when it touches water, it pretty much immediately gets soaked and weighed down trapped by the cohesive and adhesive forces of the water. The gymnosperms will secrete a small amount of watery, nectary fluid, called a pollination drop, which basically makes the entire area around the micropile very sticky to any incoming pollen. It moistens it, and it increases the surface area that the pollen has to land on to be able to successfully pollinate another plant, which increases reproductive success. When the pollen grain gets wetted and stuck to the outer coating of the ovule, it's a simple matter to direct the pollen grain to flow into the micropile, you know, because you have this water medium that it's floating in now, and into the ovum. Here, the pollen grain begins producing sperm. 
I mentioned how Psyakids and Ginkgo have mobile sperm, equipped with flagellas to swim through the water. Well, in their reproductive process, here's where those sperm would get released, and they would get their chance to swim through this watery matrix to the ovum and to the egg. The neatophytes and the conifers, on the other hand, don't have mobile sperm, and so they use a pollen tube as a transport corridor to move their sperm to the egg. So would the ginkgos and the cycads have to have their sperm like run a race or sprint down the tube to the egg? The neatophytes and the conifers, on the other hand, don't have mobile sperm, and so they use their pollen tube as a transport corridor to move their sperm to the egg. Once pollination occurs, the seed begins to form. While the conifers are the only group of gymnosperms that produce true cones, the cycads and the Welwichia mirabilis also produce cone-like structures. These retain a lot of the basic features of the conifer cone, and they work in pretty much the same way, but they just have a more primitive, less refined look to them. For example, cycad cones often grow upwards in irregular lumpy shapes, like clubs or socks stuffed with wadded up newspaper. Wilwichia mirabilis produces much smaller cones, but they serve the same purposes. In all cases, the male cones will dry out and degrade, releasing pollen into the wind, while the female cones will dry up and break apart, or they'll get chewed up by animals, or they'll just rot and decompose. And however it happens, when the, when the cone is destroyed, it reveals the seed to the greater world around it, and it gives the seed the chance to find fertile ground, to germinate, and produce a new gymnosperm individual. Okay, so that is about it for gymnosperms. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode, because I sure did. I found it really interesting to research the gymnosperms while writing the script, and I hope you found just as much interest as I did by listening to me talk about them. The gymnosperms are really cool plants, with a huge variety of unique and aesthetic growth forms. They've spread out all over the planet, to almost every habitat and biome. I mean, that's pretty intense. But even though it might seem like they're successful today, the gymnosperms were once the dominant type of plant on the planet. They were much more widespread and far more numerous. For millions of years, it was a gymnosperms world, but in an evolutionary process that began around uh, 200 million years ago, the angiosperms slowly appeared and began to shake things up. The angiosperm flowers brought new colors to the landscape, and they opened up new avenues for evolution for the divergence and speciation of pollinators and parasites and all manner of other life forms. This floral revolution was powerful enough to unseat the gymnosperms as the dominant form of plant life, usurping their position and replacing them with the flowering plants. But I'll talk more about this in the next episode. So if you're interested, if you're interested in flowering plants and how they came to be and how they diversified, be sure to stay tuned in and check it out. And as always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below. 